Yeah. 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 Let's do it. Um, I guess, you know, I'll just sit here because, you know, I have to uh, use my keyboard to kind of go back and forth here. Sounds good. Cool. Yeah. All right. Sure. Do you want me to introduce you? Yeah, if you don't mind, yeah, just yeah. a quick yeah, introduction. Yeah. It, it, and we don't, assume we're not using the owl. No. Okay. Um, so yeah, so Terry Pagano uh, has been working with myself and Tristan on, um, and then actually with also the, the uh, UW LIDAR HSRO program, um, try, working to, uh, on his master's degree, on focused on, um, and actually the other, the other component of this is actually working with me on the geostationary retrievals, pod retrievals. Um, focused on seeing how we can better utilize the ground-based observations for better understanding and validating the um, the satellite remote sensing for for this, for this case uh, ice ice cloud ice optical property retrievals um, and that's always been a challenge and, and Terry's going to kind of explain how he um, was able to leverage both our skills here at UW with the UW with, 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 with the HSRL. Um, combined with our, our capabilities with, with on the retrieval side um, to really learn something new about, uh, about our, our ability to, to measure ice ice cloud, actually sp specifically ice cloud optical thickness. So, mm -hmm. cool. thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you both. Mm -hmm. um, so for my master's thesis, I did a uh, validation of ice cloud optical thickness retrievals during Camp 2X and Piston using the UW HSR LiDAR. So I'll spend a few minutes talking about the importance of ice clouds. Um, so ice clouds are very common on our planet. Um, the global ice cloud frequency among clear sky and cloudy observations is about 53%, according to Hong ETL 2015, with the distribution um, being skewed towards optically thinner clouds. Um, ice clouds are frequently found in tropical deep convective regions, um, above 10 kilometers, as well as in the high latitude regions. Um, below about five kilometers. Um, there are a variety of ice crystal habits that may compose an ice cloud, as can be seen in the Bailey and Hallett um, uh, 2008 figure. There's just a ton of different shapes and sizes that these ice crystals could be. Um, and even within an, a cloud, um, ice crystal size can vary greatly from um, the cloud top being, you know, on the order of thousands of microns to, to the cloud base being you know, 10 microns. Um, and the assumption of the microphysical properties of clouds are important for both remote sensing observations and climate models. Um, ice clouds are very important to climate um, due to their radiative processes. Um, they have competing uh, thermal and albedo effects. Um, and optically thinner, thicker clouds tend to have more of a cooling effect, while optically thinner clouds um, that are cold at high altitudes have, tend to have more of a warming effect. So there's a key role that optical thickness plays in the radiative um, importance of these ice clouds. Um, and the ice crystal morphology it impacts the scattering phase function of the cloud and thus um, really you know, helps define um, the bulk radiative effect of the cloud. Um, models typically underpredict ice cloud mass relative to observations. Um, and it has been shown that different ice cloud models and parameterizations can lead to st st uh, significantly different long wave and short wave fluxes at the top of the atmosphere in GCM simulated tropical environments. And um, the representation of ice clouds and climate models are important for climate change projections and if misrepresented can be a source of uncertainty. Um, and this makes high clouds important for understanding climate sensitivity. Um, and because of the situation of ice clouds and models, um, long-term observations are important for assessing climate change signals related to clouds. Um, and yeah, so passive low Earth orbit cloud remote sensing um, has a long history going back to the AVHR series in the 1970, late 1970s um, with several iterations of H AVHR going into the 2019s. Um, however, you know, these AVHR um, instruments had uh, very broad spectral resolution, very few channels, and with the launch of MODIS, Terra MODIS in 1999, um, 
you know, we were a, the, these high quality cloud products began to be developed because of the increase in spectral resolution of MODIS relative to the HDR, the increase in channels such as the 2.1 micron channel that has particle size sensitivity that allows for the bispectral reflectance method, and increased spatial resolution. Um, so we have these, this MODIS climate data record um, that is very um, well, very stable, well characterized, extending for over 20 years at this point. Um, however, according to Wilicki at all 2013, it's going to take um, observational data records on the order of three decades or more to detect some of these climate trends. So it becomes very advantageous to fit to extend this MODIS climate data record um, using another instrument. And the obvious candidate is VIRS, um, which launched in 2011, 2017, 2022. And with the VIRS data record set to extend into the 2030s, um, it becomes very advantageous to make an inter-satellite cloud retrieval product that allows to hopefully, at one point, um, investigate some of these uh, cloud trends. So um, that was kind of the motivation behind the NASA Motosphere Cloud Continuity Product, um, which will be validated today. Um, it's an inter-satellite cloud retrieval product. Um, it's processed at the UW SIPS. It has a visible optical thickness product, and it used, utilizes the continuity of approach between instruments, common algorithms, auxiliary data sets, analogous spectral channels, and it has heritage with the uh, original MODIS uh, Terran Aqua algorithms. Um, another inter-satellite cloud retrieval product is the NOAA um, clouds from the ABHR extended system, CloudRx, which has ABHR heritage and is processed on, um, can process on MODIS and VIRS instruments, and they have a visible and, and an infrared optical thickness product. Um, the NASA Cloud Property Optical Thickness Retrieval um, is is a bispectral reflectance retrieval. So it it um, it utilizes the 0.64 micron channel and the 0.86 micron channel over land, um, and that is a non-absorbing shortwave channel that has high sensitivity to optical thickness. And when you add in the 2.2 um, micron channel, you also get so, uh, you also get um, sensitivity to particle size. And the presence between this two channel approach is that backscatter signature of the cloud can be more accurately described um, by incorporating not just that short wave non-absorbing channel, but also that um, channel that has sensitivity to particle size. Um, and the optical thickness retrieval utilizes um, a radiative transfer model to generate top of the atmosphere radiances um, for a variety of optical thickness and effective radius um, uh, clouds, and then they conform the spectral response function to the, or they conform their reflectance to the spectral response of the instrument, and they generate these lookup tables where they allow for a simultaneous um, uh, retrieval of uh, cloud optical thickness and effective radius. Um, the CloudRx optical thickness um, retrieval, called DCOM, um, it was again designed for the NOAA clouds from the ABHR extended system. It also utilizes the bispectral refractance me method, but does not utilize the 0.86 micron channel that over ocean um, that the uh, cloud prop retrieval does. And instead of have it has a slightly different methodology to it. It utilizes an optimal estimation uh, approach that seeks to find an optimal solution based off of the radio transfer calculations, um, the observed radiances, and the a priori. Um, so some typical assumptions in these visible retrievals, um, I pulled this, to help us kind of um, look at that, I pulled this equation from King, or King 1987, um, and you can kind of see here that for a non-absorbing uh, wavelength, the reflection function is a function, at the reflection function observed at the sensor is a function of the atmosphere contribution and the surface contribution, and the atmosphere contribution is partially defined by the optical thickness and the scattering properties that you assume from the ice cloud, uh, while the surface is, is partially a function of the uh, spherical albedo and transmittance of the, of the atmosphere, which is also a function of cloud optical thickness. So as you get a thicker and thicker cloud, your transmittance will go down and you'll, 
and your surface albedo will not, that term essentially goes smaller. Um, but an important thing here is that over ocean, um, because the 0.86 micron channel is very dark over ocean, um, and you don't really have this surface reflection contribution is small, you really get to, you know, investigate um, the validity of your um, scattering, uh, ice crystal scattering um, assumption. So, um, yeah, over ocean sampling uh, provides a very unique opportunity to validate the uh, ice scattering assumptions that are in these physical retrievals. Um, so the ice scattering assumption um, is really the it's the phase function which describes the angular intensity of scattered radiation. Um, and Yang ETL 2013 developed an ice scattering database for a variety of ice crystal habits um, where he you know, outputted the Singer scattering albedo, the asymmetry parameter, and extinction efficiency, um, and put all these results into a lookup table. And it was in Hulls et al. 2016 where he determined severely roughened aggregate columns we're able to really bring these visible retrievals into radiate closure with the IR, which is why the MODIS C6 retrieval adapted these um, that severely roughened aggregated columns um, um, assumption into the retrievals. Um, and the last retrieval we'll be looking at is the Cyberx Asha infrared retrieval. Um, it is a again another optimal estimation retrieval that utilizes satellite emitted radiances. To, um, to make a optical thickness measurement, and it utilizes the Hacha cloud top height to get, which is a CO2 slicing method, to retrieve the cloud top temperature, and it also uses the 11 and 12 micron um, channels to get sensitivity to particle size. And some typical assumptions for these infrared retrievals are, um, are the clear sky emitted radiances, which usually come from a radiative transfer model, as well as and um, the important parameters that um, Asha usually seeks to calculate is the brightness temperature, or is the temperature of the cloud, and the cloud emissivity. And the cloud emissivity is related to the uh, optical thickness. And it is worth saying that there is some scattering in the infrared. Um, however, the scattering is very small. So let's talk about we have. So we have these. Um, we have these retrieval algorithms with a variety of assumptions, um, and now what we really seek to do is figure out, okay, how well, how good are our assumptions in these retrievals, and how well do these retrievals um, agree with, um, you know, high quality in situ observations? And that's where the HSRL comes in. Um, I got this figure from, um, I think it was HSRL UW website, um, but it's a three-channel lighter, where it has a molecular, a combined, and a cross-polarization channel. Um, it operates at 532 nanometers, and it provides accurate vertical profile information using attenuated backscatter. And the, one of the cool things about this LIDAR is that it has an iodine absorption cell, and because you know the frequency that your, um, your laser is shooting, um, when you get a return signal, some of that signal will be Doppler shifted by the by the thermal motion of molecules, while the sig particulate signal um, really won't be as won't have that strong shift because of the therm because you know the aerosols are just kind of moving with the flow, and they end up tuning the iodine absorption cell to kind of isolate the molecular signal from the particulate signal. Um, another advantage of the HSRL. Um, is that it allows for the direct measurement of extinction or optical thickness and doesn't need to assume a lighter ratio and well, like Calypso does. Also the field of view is so narrow that the multiple scattering correction is not needed whereas in Calypso um, they assume a multiple scattering um, of I think 0.61 or something. Um, and to really stress the difference between or the value of the HSRL um, Here's a kind of visual um, representation of, or not visual, um, you can really see from the equations that the, um, the traditional LiDAR, you only get one power received per level, and you don't know the, first of all, you don't know 
the phase function of the cloud of the of you know what you're measuring. Um, but you also don't know the backscatter. You can't isolate the back the aerosol backscatter and the optical thickness from each other. Um, however, with the HSRL um, in the molecular part of the signal, you know because the molecular backscatter is proportional to atmospheric density, you're able to determine with very little assumptions the uh, the optical thickness. And once you know this optical thickness, it provides a um, calibration target to determine the other um, the backscatter um, the backscattered aerosol contribution. So we have this really high quality, um, high spectral resolution LIDAR with these very, very um, good um, optical thickness measurements with very little, with very good, well quantified assumptions. Um, so, but however, low Earth orbit and validating these retrievals from low Earth orbit presents some challenges. First of all, there's very few direct in situ ocean based HSRL measurements. And that's actually pretty important because the, the, to validate that scattering phase function assumption, you really need to have the surface albedo, you know, really not dominating or not really contributing to that reflection function. You see at the top of that, you see from the sensor. Um, and individual LEO instruments, you, only, you get two times per day for location, but you know, you get ascending and descending. And sometimes for the visible, that's only one measurement because you, you, know, you don't get visible retrievals at night. Um, another challenge is frequently frequency of observed cirrus. Um, Inter-pixel horizontal cloud inner homogeneity. Um, multiple multi-layer cloud scenes, and um, you can't sample all of these clouds using the HSRL um, because at one point you will attenuate your li your lidar. So you're really um, confining yourself to a small subset or a subset of those uh, ice clouds you can validate. Um, however, there have been some advancement in geostationary imager technology uh, relative to the previous series. Um, I made this table right here. Um, essentially, you know, with these, when you compare GOES 12 through 15 to um, AHI and, and GOES 16, you have way more channels, um, such as the point, the 2.2 micron channel that is sensitive to particle size, um, as well as the 2. Point, or 12.3 channel that is utilized in the split window. So, these channels allow for modus-like cloud retrievals from geostationary orbit, and to help with co to really kind of you know, for her to help with co-location, essentially, um, you have higher spatial resolution, from, which went from four kilometers to two kilometers, so you're more sure of what, you know, the HSRL is looking at, um, or you're more sure that the geostationary imager and the HSRL are looking at the same thing, and you have a higher temporal resolution of 10 minutes, which kind of helps, you know, really make sure that these instruments are um, more likely to look at the same parts of clouds. So in this, Uh, so in the study, um, we used HI to validate the NASA cloud property and cloud Rex visible and infrared retrievals. Um, we were very fortunate to get this UW HSRL on the Office of Naval Research piston ship or campaign, um, which was in 2018, and that provided ocean ocean um, measurements from the HSRL. And then we also had the UW Camp 2X HSRL located over an urban environment which was at the Manila uh, Observatory in the Philippines. So you can't just load up this HSRL data and compare it to the geostationary and uh, ice cloud optical thickness products. You first have to, um, you know, you have to calculate the optical thickness of the ice cloud from the HSRL measurements. So an HSRL inversion was performed. Um, and once that ancient surreal inversion was performed, um, I created this ice cloud detection algorithm. And the way the algorithm works is the first thing it does is it finds all the potential ice cloud vertical levels um, using a variety of threshold conditions, such as um, the linear depolarization has to be higher than um, 0.27, um, which is valid for this part of uh, the world. Uh, the backside cross section is 10 to the 6, and the molecular signal to noise ratio has to be greater than 1. 
So once I found all of the potential ice cloud vertical levels within a profile, um, I ran it through a cloud continuity condition, so it had to be continuous for at least three vertical levels. And I wanted to make sure I added a, a attenuation condition for the molecular SNR to be greater than 15, I mean, I'm sorry, greater than one at 15 kilometers. And um, the running optical depth of the profile had to be less than 2.5 for the last detected ice cloud level. Um, and then after I isolated these potential cloud segments, I said, okay, does the signal attenuate within the cloud? And if it doesn't, then I make sure that the molecular SNR meets the threshold two vertical levels above the cloud top. And if that's, that's still um, valid, then I go to calculate the ice cloud optical thickness. And I take the running um, optical thickness at the cloud for the first detected ice cloud level at the base. And then I take the um, I average the signal, the optical thickness, or the photon count signal above the cloud, um, run it through the forward model equations to calculate the optical thickness of the of the layer of, of the uh, layer above the cloud, and then take the difference between that layer and the cloud base. Um, and if the signal did attenuate within the cloud, then I try to vertically average to improve my SNR and try my um, try these thresholds again. So this is kind of a visual display of, um, of the ice cloud detected levels in red. So those are all indicated with ice. This, the left is the optical thickness. This is the backscatter cross section, and this is the molecular signal to noise ratio. Um, the red lines are the thresholds. Um, so all of these red are the detected ice cloud levels, and that vertical line is the above cloud Average optical thickness value. And you can kind of see as you get higher and higher, the optical thickness becomes more noisy. And so that's kind of one of the reasons why it's important to average the signal above the cloud like that to increase your certainty of your optical thickness measurement. Um, so this is a cloud uh, from the Manila HSRL. Um, on the x axis is time, y axis is altitude. You can clearly see a, a, uh, a high cloud right here above. 13 kilometers and below 17 kilometers. Um, the depolarization indicates that the phase is ice. And then these, what the cloud boundaries look like. Um, another thing we did was quantify the uncertainty in our HSRL measurements. And the way this was done was by using a bootstrapping methodology. Um, and the bootstrapping methodology um, utilizes all three channels within the HSRL, and as well as the, the principle that photon counting noise is roughly Poisson. So what we did is we generated a Poisson distribution about the signal count about the, uh, around the, uh, around the uh, photon counts, and randomly sampled it. We took the randomly sampled, and we did that in three channels. And we took the randomly sampled photon counts in three channels, um, put them into the HSRL forward models, generated the geophysical parameters, and then ran the ice cloud detection algorithm while calculating a unique signal to noise ratio for each bootstrap iteration. And then we calculate the optical thickness. We do this 100 times, take, them, take the standard deviation, and that gives us our uncertainty in our HSRL measurements. And it's worth noting to say that the mean of all of these iterations is um, is pretty much the same as the uh, as the original photon count. Um, they we so we also looked at so this is a measurement of optical thickness by uncertainty over here on the uh, top left axis is uncertainty um, on the bottom. Uh, left y-axis is the counts per bin. The red is the camp 2 x HSRL. The blue is the piston HSRL, which is the over ocean. And these are not stacked. The piston HSRL is in front of the camp 2 x um, So what's kind of interesting here is you can kind of see that the piston HSRL has lower uncertainty than the camp 2 x HSRL. And that could be because the piston ship was in a more pristine environment than the um, than the CAM 2 XHSRL, which was in a more of an urban environment. 
um, I perform quality control on the HSRL data to really make sure that the clouds that I select to compare to um, the cloud crop retrieval are homogeneous and have the highest probability of seeing of you know seeing of the HSRL seeing the same thing as the uh, the geostationary um, instrument within its two kilometer pixel. So um, I guess the first thing I did was any IoT measurements with greater than 15% uncertainty from the bootstrap were discarded. Um, I removed profiles with water clouds as well as water clouds in adjacent profiles just to kind of make sure that um, if you have a water cloud in your field of view uh, or if you have a water cloud in your two kilometer pixel um, from your geostationary imager, it's just that you're going to have a way higher optical thickness value and you're going to be biased. Um, I also ran some cloud uniformity tests indicated by the HSREL, which looked at the standard deviation of cloud top height and ice cloud optical thickness within adjacent profiles. So um, I also discarded thick planetary um, boundary layer observations. So these are examples of ice clouds that were, would be discarded. Um, and this is an example of a thick planetary boundary layer from the Manila Observatory that would not be um, used, and then this is a good um, planetary boundary layer. Uh, so let's get to the IoT validation. So using the my HSRL um, ice cloud detection algorithm slash retrieval, uh, we were able to generate and isolate the ice cloud optical thickness measurements. They were then matched up to the geostationary imager using a simple distance formula on the parallax corrected um, uh, position. And for these measure, these uh, scatter plots you see here are for the piston deployment. And these are actually really, really important because this really gets at your um, ice cloud scattering assumption. And you do not really have a lot of reflectance contribution from the underlying surface because over ocean, the 0.86 micron channel is dark. So to the left is the uh, HI infrared retrieval on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is the HSRL ice cloud optical thickness. And you can see they agree very, very well with the best fit line um, of an R squared of about 0.8. The, um, the HI Clabrex visible retrieval, um, using the optimal estimation um, methodology, had a high bias while the AHI cloud property retrieval um, had a, um, it had, I guess it's very, very small high bias, but honestly it's, it looks pretty, pretty good. Um, it has an R squared of 0.69. And what this really shows is that the ice cloud scattering assumption, the asymmetry parameter used in the um, NASA cloud property retrieval is more or less valid for this part of the world, for these ice clouds that are observed during the Piston campaign. Um, we also did a validation over the urban environment of Manila, the Manila Observatory. Um, the left is the uh, infrared, and then it's the middle is CloudRx visible, the right is Cloud Property visible, and the infrared agrees very, very well. It only lost 0 .03. Um, of its R squared value. And what this really gets at here is the um, clear sky radiance assumption um, that I believe they use PFAS to generate is very, very good over an urban environment. Um, however, and, on, and from these results, for single layer thin ice clouds, the infrared is, works really, really well. Um, going to the more the visible retrievals, um, they both have high biases, and this again it is highly likely due to the, sur the surface reflection contribution over Manila and the very complex BRDF in that in that region. Um, because when you compare the AHI cloud property visible retrieval to the uh, to the over from over Man from Manila, and you compare that to the one over Piston that ocean environment, um, you know, the piston shows good agreement. I mean, the, the AHI cloud property visible retrieval shows good agreement with piston. 
Um, however, when you put it over an urban environment, you know, you get this high volume. So it, it's more, it's probably the surface reflectance. Um, I also looked at the retrieval bias by scattering angle, and when I say retrieval bias, it's the ratio, it's the or the retrieval ratio of the cloud property retrieval, or the you know the geostationary retrieval over the H, HSRL retrieval. So it's really the the y-axis is the ratio of the two retrievals, and you can just kind of see that um, it's not a function of scattering angle. Um, this is a uh, a representation of the, uh, or not representation, this is a Google Images um, of the actual surface of the Manila Observatory. I just kind of wanted to see what it looked like, you know? Um, and you can really see that it's a very complex environment. They have, um, you know, metal roofing over there. They also have, um, you know, pixels that are very inhomogeneous, such as over the observatory itself where you have vegetative regions as well as ur uh, urban environments. So it's a very complex surface BRDF to environment. Um, another thing worth mentioning about this study uh, was when the NASA cloud property retrieval was generated, um, originally there was a, um, the 2.2 the .2 micron channel was dimmer than, um, than, it could have been, than it should have been and a radiometric calibration correction Resulted in a um, resulted in a higher yield um, for the NASA cloud property retrieval, and that's because um, likely these values were falling out of the lookup table because the solution space, as you get to thinner optical thickness values and smaller reflectances, the solution space just gets smaller and smaller. So they're likely falling out of the lookup table, providing um, a retrieval failure. All right, so to uh, wrap it up, um, you know, we developed this HSRL to independently val validate these two um, cross-satellite retrieval products, the NASA um, Cloud Property and the NOAA FiberX Ice Cloud Optical Thickness Retrievals over both land and ocean. Uh, the infrared retrieval was the best retrieval, or it agreed the best with HSRL, and it really didn't lose any um, quantifiable variance, only zero point. 03 between ocean and land. Um, and that's a cloud property retrieval. Um, performed very well as well uh, with a correlation pulpit, or with an R squared value of 0.69. And what that showed is, well, in previous um, studies, there have been, it has been showed that some ice scattering assumptions um, end up, the, the visible retrievals end up having a high bias relative to the infrared and likely due to this ice scattering phase function assumption. Um, and because of that, a new ice scattering phase function was adopted. And what we showed here is that that assumption is valid for the, the, the clouds that were measured during piston. Um, and for the visible retrievals, um, the surface albedo was poorly constrained over Manila for both visible ice cloud optical thickness products, which resulted in a high bias in those environments. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Um, I guess we'll open up for questions. Terry, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more um, I'm just trying to kind of put all the pieces together. During Piston, mm -hmm. the one visible product compared better than mm -hmm. the other with HSRL. Could you just elaborate a little bit more about what you learn about assumptions based on one being better than the other? Could you just elaborate a little more on that? I didn't quite catch that. Yeah, um, let me go with that. So the, um, the CloudRx visible product and the... For Piston. Yeah, sorry. I'm, oh, it's I'm, just delayed. I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm trying. I got it. No, it's, it's just really slow because I have all these figures in the PowerPoint. Yeah, okay. this one. Yeah. Yeah, so um, these retrievals actually had very similar assumptions. They just had a difference in methodology. 
So the uh, HI Claver X visible retrieval had a uh, optimal estimation based um, method. And from what I understand is that with optimal estimation, if you don't have good agreement with your forward model and your observed um, reflectance or radiances, it could revert to the, pri to the a priori. Um, I'm not sh exactly sure if that's what's happening here, um, but the assumptions within these retrievals were very similar, were the same as far as the ice scattering assumption. So it would have to be a difference in methodology for the retrieval. And the fact that it might revert back to an a priori that isn't appropriate for this region or this scenario. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure um, exactly, um, you know, the exact um, inner workings of the optimal estimation, but I would think that that would be okay. accurate. And they take the priority from clips of ontology. So do you, if I can ask a follow-up question to that, yeah. then. Like this is one particular area and you had to have a lot of criteria to mm -hmm. whittle down to a pretty small set of data points, which I understand why. So do you think then that that would be a similar bias in other oceanic regions, or do you think you captured enough variation in maybe ice particle types or optical to the thicknesses that this could be valid elsewhere? Um, I would have caution to use this in other locations. I think that more, age, more validation studies um, HS rail validation studies um, should be examined before really kind of making that assumption, that statement. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, yeah, I would be cautious to say that this would be valid everywhere because I, I just don't yeah. know. So the, the 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 points that you show here did mm -hmm. that span a pretty wide range of variation in ice cloud properties or? Um, are they all pretty similar? Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say that they would actually be more similar because the ship was only out there for three months. Got it. So we were kind of only looking at like the, a very specific, you know, region at a very specific time of the year. So, and from what I've seen, kind of just looking at these, um, you know, the the figures of the HSRL backscatter cross section over time and altitude, mm -hmm. the ice clouds look pretty similar. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Terry? I have a question. Yeah. So, what other work, like in, have you, did you do kind of look, looking at the literature and what's been done? You know, is this really a unique piece of work? Is, has this been done? What? Has there other been people who tried to do validation of satellite-based remote, you know, retrievals using these ground-based um, instruments? Or what, what's unique about this? Right. So first of all, one thing that's unique about this is using the HSRL. Um, you know, that that in itself is unique. Um, another thing that is very unique about this is that you have the HSRL over ocean. And you have the opportunity to use this um, this lidar with highly with a highly accurate optical thickness measurement, and to validate these retrievals. And to date, it's been really hard to validate these retrievals over ocean um, because of how much you know you need because of the sampling criteria here. Um, you only have this HSRL out there on the ship for like you know three months for this piston study. And you're just not going to get the sampling to really have a to build a um, valid comparison without using those geostationary products. And it was really until recently that um, you know the AHI went up um, and it had all the spectral channels to create modus-like retrievals. And then we were you know fortunate enough to have the UW SIPS process those I mean run this retrieval on the geostationary imager to really get that increased sampling that we needed to get build up the statistics to validate these retrievals. Right, so I mean, like this required, this this was a beta retrieval for the ice clouds, but so the thickness retrieval applied to the geo. This is really brand new. The HSRL, right, is really unique to this building. Um, there really isn't any other instrument capable of doing this type of measurement. A, on a continuous basis, especially on a ship. So there really hasn't really been this this get, getting enough statistics to really say something 
kind of an app, you know, the, the way I compare this is kind of the AeroNet, familiar with aerosols, for for ice clouds. And we really have, this is really, a, is a really a new, this hasn't been done as far as I know. Um, so we really didn't have a grounding. I, I have two questions sort of related to that, that mm -hmm. line of um, thinking. Um, I guess the first one, maybe maybe right on, uh, piggybacking on the comment about Aeronet, I mean, is there, does a recommendation come out of this work then that, uh, you know, having a sustained set of HSRL measurements, okay, over a ship that might, or, you know, from a ship that might be difficult, but let's say in a forested area or somewhere where the BRDF is maybe well behaved or we feel like it's well known, would this argue for doing that for like multiple years, like an aeronet, like let's just do continuous HSRL measurements in order to do this? Would you yeah. suggest that or recommend that? Um, as long, you know, yeah, I think that would be a good a good uh, strategy if you have a well quantified BRDF under the surface. Um, that's pro really important for the retrieval side to make sure that the HSRL is seeing, you know, the calculated ice cloud optical thickness, you know, is, is um, yeah, just to make sure that you really have a well-behaved environment when you make these comparisons. Um, another thing is that if you run it over multiple years or um, in different areas, you're really getting at um, the variability in the ice cloud, uh, ice cloud um, properties, you know, which is pretty important. And I think the thing that was lacking in the study was um, you know we have a single location for uh, for a specific time period and um, you know we just don't know how this would behave in other parts of the world with dip, with ice clouds that have a slightly different morphology to them. If, did that answer? Yeah, yeah, it did actually. No, you added nicely to it. Um, the other question I had was, and I don't know if you mentioned this or not, so I apologize if I missed yeah. it, but you. Um, the reason for using GEO is obvious for matching with the HSRL. So did you talk at all about how the GEO algorithm compares to the MODIS spheres? Did you, I'm just trying to connect the circle back to what you said at the beginning, um, that your, your main motivation was this longer term record of, of MODIS spheres. Um, how, how does the GEO algorithm performance compare to the MODIS spheres algorithm? Um, I think doing a matchup of just matching up the you know, taking a bunch, if I was to stamp out a box over a piston, you know, this is where the piston ship was, and then I take the geo, um, and these, I'm sorry, NASA cloud property retrieval algorithm on geo, and then I take the veers and modus, um, you know, instruments and that same um, algorithm run on those instruments and just do a simple matchup and see how it compares. I think that would be pretty valuable. I know that Platnik, um, ETL, at all 2021 compared the MODIS and Veer's um, instruments with the common algorithm, but I don't know exactly how it would impact the GEO, but um, the spectral position of the 2.2 micron channel in AHI is more analogous to Veer's, so I would think it would be more similar to Veer's, but I have not done that um, myself, but I think that would be a really important piece of the puzzle to go in if I was to publish this literature. Yeah, I mean, just as another point on that, so I think both MODIS and VIRS are on sun-synchronous satellites, whereas GEO is obviously sampling across the whole time of day. So there may be some wrinkles in the, the comparisons you're doing here may have actually different combinations of solar zenith angle and right. view angle than yeah. you're going to see from MODIS, VIRS, and that sort of thing. So it's it, there's a, probably a lot of work actually involved in what, what we just talked about. So something I do want to add is I looked at the scattering angles, and the scattering angles that I um, that I saw were actually within the scattering angles of of um, of MODIS and of uh, the lower orbit instruments. So I think that's uh, an important statement that I, that I forgot to mention. Any other questions? Go ahead. Hi, Terry. Um, your HSRL IoT retrieval algorithm, how much of it was based on like previous literature? How much did you develop on your own? Yeah, so I was, uh, I was, I utilized the HSRL forward models that were given to me. Um, however, I would, I 
So the geophysical variables, you know, that was just kind of, I was following previous literature in that. Um, as far as the, um, the, the algorithm I actually developed, um, that was kind of my own work, but I did draw on some previous literature about recommendations on the depolarization ratio for ice plays. Um, but yeah, that's... You think you should really, I mean, Will and Murray was definitely yeah, the did. person that, that, that guided you on how to do that. But that's the yeah. way so she should really be. Yeah, Will, Willem really uh, spent a lot of time with me to help me figure out how to kind of perform those inversions. He um, he kind of had a um, a, a like a code. He had a, a uh, Jupyter notebook code that really helped me kind of figure out how to do that inversion myself. Um, and then he also kind of helped me with the uh, bootstrapping methodology and kind of how to how to do that. So I did get some help in this project from uh, people from the uh, cloud, um, from Bob's team. I see that that bootstrapping methodology is, uh, you know, we we one struggle with, well, not just the HSRL, but we but all the inversion methodologies coming up with, you know, meaningful uncertainties. Mm -hmm. um, that bootstrap, you know, that that's actually. Uh, an interesting way of approaching the uncertainty problem um, that has rigor behind it that is defensible. So, um, I feel like I've seen that in the radar community as, as well a little bit with the you know, drop size distribution, like mm -hmm. rainfall retrievals, you vary the uncertainty. Yeah, it's the same idea. Yeah, draw mm -hmm. random samples. Yeah, but, but but it kind of rely, it depends on you having well um, having that. The photon county provide you a Poisson distribution. You, know, you, you have to know what your noise statistics look like um, to, to, to make it to make it valid and work well. But that was another unique, definitely unique piece of work. It was thanks to Wilhelm. And so, is this work being published? Just um, yeah, I hope to publish this work. And honestly, I really like the idea of matching up some some uh, mode spheres geo. Yeah, and, and we have those matchups done here. Yeah. So you know. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. So you could use those. Uh, I, th I think that would really kind of round out this work and kind of put it in a larger mm -hmm. context and how this um, this validation fits into the larger climate record. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks, Terry. Good job, Terry.